Okay, so the mic is working. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, 2022 China Lecture Cafe series. I'm very happy to see that we still uh, were able to draw some audience here on site in the library, the Krok. Uh, there are uh, several people also watching this, uh, this presentation today online through the live stream that we, uh, we have here right present in this room. Before I um, introduce the speaker to you, I would like to say a few words about, about myself, about the China platform because I, I don't know if everybody is this familiar uh, with this platform um, and with me, the coordinator of the, of the platform. Uh, so um, the China platform is, is one of the five regional platforms in Kent University that are embedded in the, in the structure of Kent University in order to strategize on a specific region uh, in the world. The China platform is the oldest platform, and this year we also celebrated the 15th anniversary of the platform, which was founded in 2006. So uh, we have already made some history. We also published three books already uh, as a China platform to put in the spotlight, to put the focus on the specific uh, corporations that we have all over our 11 faculties in Ghent University. And these books can also be found electronic version on the website of the of the China platform. I myself uh, am uh, Inge Mangelskots. I'm a sinologist, so I studied in Ghent University. I have lived 13 years uh, in Shanghai uh, in the past, where I worked 12 years for the Belgian Consul General before I came back in 2009. Uh, to coordinate uh, the World Expo for the Port of Antwerp, first of all, uh, and to then finally start working for Ghent University in September 2010. So, enough about myself, enough about the platform. Some words still about uh, the, the China Lecture Cafe series. Huh? So we are celebrating or we are organizing, hosting this 2022 edition. Uh, but in fact, the China Lecture Cafe series were launched, established in 2012 by my predecessor, Isabel de Kuhn, uh, in order to create a platform uh, for our Ghent University professors, many of them being uh, renowned experts uh, in different fields, to put a focus on specific aspects and accomplishments in the framework of their cooperation with their partners in the specific region. Apart from these uh, presentations by our first presentations by Argent University professors, we have over the years also uh, addressed bigger topics for a much wider audience, including people uh, including professors, but also staff, employees, people from outside Kent University, who do not have any, uh, ex who did not have or do not have any experience with uh, collaborating with partners in this specific region. In this 2022 edition, we will focus on the latest developments in the cross-trade relations in the region by providing uh, the view of some big experts, I must say, from within Ghent University and the Royal Egmont uh, Institute in Brussels. Without any further ado, I would now like to introduce to you Dr. Tobias Gerke, who will give the second lecture in the framework of our China Lecture Cafe Series 2022. The title of his lecture China's geoeconomic gambit with technology interdependence and the future of the global economy. A few words about who is Dr. Tobias Gerke. Tobias Gerke is a research fellow at the Egmont Royal Institute in Brussels and global fellow with the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. His research centers on geoeconomics the geoeconomic strategies of the great powers and their implications for the global economy. Tobias was a visiting fellow at the National University in Singapore, Nottingham University, 
and at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies in Washington, uh, at John Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. He recently defended his uh, PhD at Kent University with the title Geoeconomics, How Great Power Competition is Transforming the Global Economy. That's quite a title. Introduction to the lecture, um, it's war. The United States and China are now in a technology war. A war over who controls the keys to critical technologies set to fundamentally transform our societies and the way states exert power. Technology restrictions and decoupling measures are profiting. How did we get here? This lecture will look at China's technology, China's technology gambit from Mao Zedong to Xi Jinping, its success, its failures, and what challenges and opportunities the great power technology conflict may spell for Europe and the global economy. So please, Tobias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Inge. Um, there's a bit of an echo on my voice, I believe. Was it just me who heard this? Any case, um, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, yes, so my title is a bit provocative. Uh, it starts with saying it is war. We are at war. And it's a bit of provocative, of course, because... We are, in fact, in another war, of course. There's a war in a European border. But the United States and China are, in fact, in a war. Um, how do I get to my slides here, I wonder? Ah, OK. I had to skip a couple of ones. All right. Um, I'm not a China expert per se. You heard from my, my PhD is on how the great powers in general compete. And I'm usually more on the side of what does Europe do? How do we um, engage China, the United States? What should Europe do? But there's a lot that China is doing and a lot China is, uh, is facing in the technological world. And that's the focus of, of, of this presentation. It's the first time I put together some slides on this. So bear with me as I also have to kind of look at what I actually put on my slides. But yes, it's war. So it's provocative, but it's true. Uh, the United States has declared a technology war on China. Last week, the Biden administration tightened an already existing export control regime on semiconductors, the chips that go into everything that we need from cars to fridges but especially the high advanced semiconductors that you need for everything from artificial intelligence development to fighter jets to uh, you know, powerful supercomputers that you need for biosciences, for anything that's the future of technology, you need super powerful chips. And China can't produce them yet. And America has really tightened the access now last week uh, how China can actually get these chips, not only from America, but also from allies like Europe, South Korea, Japan, and so on. That's quite significant because it really puts a big question mark to what the future of China's technology development will be, but also it puts a big question mark of what America's designs are with China. Uh, if you've been following this for a little bit, there have been a lot of technology restrictions in the last years, starting under Trump. Uh, the Trump administration restricted already certain technologies, also some semiconductors, but more narrow they restricted, for example, access for Huawei, this Chinese uh, telecoms company, and for other companies, more specific companies that they identified as dangerous, risky. But now, this rest these restrictions were really broadened quite a lot. And that puts really uh, a big question mark also for us. So what is America doing? What is America's end goal with China in the technological sphere? And do we in Europe want to really go with America? Do we even have an option to say no? Or are we just bound by American leadership? But also China is doing a lot in the technological sphere. Right? China is, and that's sort of the subject of, the to of this lecture, been for many years trying to get rid of being dependent on Western technologies. China and Chinese leaders know 
that semiconductors or other technologies that they need from the West. And they try to um, have tr been trying to, dive, to, to, to get rid of these dependencies by investing at home, by trying to get these technologies, control these technologies, imitate these technologies. China has grand designs to replace a lot of the technological advantages that Europe and America has with its own designs. There's a lot of designs to, to decrease uh, what, are, what European companies, um, the kind of research and, and, and know-how that European companies still hold. It wants to replace, and that's also a big question for us. And China has its own designs to be an independent technology power, and that's potentially a big problem for us because, of course, Europe also doesn't want to uh, lose its leading position in certain industries to China. So there's a big, big competition brewing, and it's really getting quite hot. So the question is really for me, how do we get here, right? How do we get to last week, the last escalation in a, in a trade war between America and, and China, and Europe is, of course, part of this somehow. So how do we get here? There's a lot of variables, right? All the powers have something to do with it, uh, Europe, America. But since we're focusing on China, I have some... Um, some slides on China, of what China, China's ideas have been in a technological sphere. So ever since um, the um, Communist Party took over in China, basically since 1950, when, um, um, or in the 1950s, when the newly minted Communist uh, China um, was relying a lot on Soviet support in the technological sphere. Um, there was a famous split between, of course, the Soviet and the uh, Chinese politics um, in the 1950s. Uh, Khrushchev and Mao had this famous fallout. In the 1950s, the Soviet Union was supplying much of the advanced industrial products and technologies at the, of the time to China. It was basically China was reliant on the Soviet Union for this. Um, because China joined the Korean War informally, it was also under heavy sanctions regime already from America and the West. The coordinating committee, the COCOM, there was a China-specific uh, section that controlled a lot of exports. China had very little access from the West to technologies and industrial goods, um, so it relied on um, the Soviet Union. But after this famous fallout... These ideas of self-reliance were really growing under uh, Maoist China to be self-reliant in the economic realm, but especially in the technological realm. Self-reliant, developing technologies, uh, military technologies, most importantly, um, but also commercial technologies. And so they had some successes under, under, uh, under Maoist China. There's a famous program, the Two Bombs, One Satellite program that Mao started to develop the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb by themselves. They already had basically the plans from the Soviets, but they managed to set up the industrial process to, to develop these bombs. Um, and some other designs were, were developing um, at the time. And so this idea, that's the more important thing, I think this idea of self-reliance, right? Whether it was successful or not, we can debate, but the idea that China is only a power if it is self-reliant in important economic and technological capabilities. And that idea stuck basically through China's history and is very much alive today. It really feeds from the 1950s and it's being referenced all the way to today. Um, and had its, uh, its ups and downs under uh, Deng Xiaoping, the famous reformer, of course, who opened up China. Um, um, Self-reliance became sort of reinterpreted. It was not so much that that meant China has to develop everything by itself. But it, does, it did mean that China needs to engage. He tried to mold this, this idea, this, this narrative of self-reliance a bit more to his agenda. So he said, independence, read self-reliance, does not mean shutting the door on the world, nor does self-reliance mean blind opposition to everything foreign. So it was a bit of a shift in narrative, of course. But the, the idea survived. And while China opened up in much of trade and much of, much of its economy, or some part of its economy did open up, 
this idea of self-reliance remained very strong in, in the technological realm, especially semiconductors, right? The 1980s, semiconductors become incredibly important. Japan is a leading uh, a producer of, of, of semiconductors at the time. And China, under Deng Xiaoping, also in the 1980s, developed the first industrial projects to, to become self-reliant in, 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 in these technologies. So it created, it, it, it used public money, it created clusters of universities and, and researchers and, and public institutions to become, um, to, to develop this technology and not be dependent on Japan especially, but also America. And this idea that technology is at the heart of national power is very strong in, in, in Chinese history and was really never um, away. Right, so asked by a journalist of you know, how can China in the 1980s afford these mega projects of trying to develop the most advanced technologies, which at the time were semiconductors and still are. Uh, China at the 1980s still uh, comparatively poor. How could, it, you know, how could it afford it? And you know, in the, this is from 1981, I think, a quote, Deng Xiaoping saying that, you know, um, without this, without these technologies, without being in control of technologies, without holding in our own hands the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, and these other projects that uh, China was trying to develop, it couldn't be said that China is an influential power. China cannot afford to fall behind. China cannot afford not to be engaged, despite of the fact that we are poor. I, th I find this an interesting quote because it was it, it sort of gives away that Technology and innovation have always played a very important role among Chinese elites. That only if you are in control of, of these processes are you are a power. And so despite integrating with the West in the 1980s and especially then 1990s and 2000s, these ideas remained very much alive. Skipping ahead a bit, this is still very much the case today. Right. In the 21st century, um, these ideas that China is, or the, the great powers are in a competition, that they're in a competition over who controls advanced technologies, who controls advanced manufacturing, is a guiding principle, became again a guiding principle of, of, of Chinese policy. Right. So Xi Jinping famously said, only by grasping key core technologies in our own hands can we fundamentally guarantee national economic security, national defense security, and other securities. So this control, having be self-lined, having these, these technologies in their own hands was uh, a very important. The famous Made in China 2025 strategy from 2015, uh, famous uh, industrial policy strategy at the time, which set out a grand goal that China will be a leading power in 10 advanced manufacturing technology uh, industries also made a lot of references to this idea of control and only those who have um, um, control over advanced manufacturing, only those powers are real powers and they have security and all these ideas. So building internationally competitive manufacturing is the only way China can enhance its strength, protect state security and become a world power. This idea that it has to be controlled and uh, the risk of being dependent on, on other powers, in other words. So in the 2010s, especially, China has, well, really throughout history, but in the last years, China had adopted a significant technological strategy to catch up with the West and to become self-reliant eventually down the road. And there's a lot going on, obviously, in this field. It's a big field, but I try to group it basically in three things that China has been doing. In digital innovation, tech transfer, and technological or technical standardization. And um, the idea of indigenous innovation is that um, China must develop and own critical technologies right, and decrease foreign dependence. Um, 
technology transfer, the objective is to acquire and to capture foreign technologies. And technical, technical standardizations, so technical standards are the things that you know, are everywhere, that, def that define what is something. You know? uh, this is a technical standard, it's an A4, Dean A4, right? This is a technical standardized bottle because manufacturers agree that 0 0.5 liters is a good way to sell a bottle. You have this for everything. Those countries or those companies that, that are at the cutting edge who develop a new product, right, who develop this bottle and say, this is a good way, 0 0.5 liters is a pretty good way. We set the standard the first and then others will follow. They have a quite a significant advantage in becoming a technological leader. So those countries or those companies who define standards are really tech leaders. And China has identified this for many years and has been very active in this field. So just some quick examples because obviously this is a lot, uh, there's a lot going on. But in terms of indigenous innovation, basically China has been uh, uh, spending huge amounts of public money, industrial subsidies. So subsidies that are given out by the state is public money from uh, the, the purse to, to fund all sorts of industries, but especially uh, those industries that are identified as particularly important, those industries that are identified in these um, strategies, like Made in China 2025, had 10 industries. Um, then there were other plans, there were a lot of plans, there's always some plan with some industries defined or some technologies that are being defined, and China has been giving a lot of public funding to these. How much? We don't actually know, but there are some estimations um, just how large China's uh, uh, public spending on, on, on in the economy is. And this is a very conservative estimate that China might be some 1.5 or 1.7% of its GDP. There's other estimates that go all the way up to 5% of GDP. What does this mean? It just means that it's at least three, four, if not many times more than any of the Western economies. This is a huge problem because it's creating a lot of trouble with, with, uh, with the West, that China is spending a lot of money, it's directing public money into industries, and it makes, this, uh, it makes these markets where China spends so much money quite uncompetitive, because private companies who do not get this money, this, this money a Belgian company that doesn't get this kind of luxury, cannot compete against a Chinese company that gets... Um, so many subsidies. So it's a huge, huge issue in international trade for many years um, that China has been spending so much on what it believes is critical. As I said, especially on technologies that it thinks it must become self-reliant. So this is terribly small, so you can't really see it. So let me explain what you basically see. It's a comparison of the kind of subsidies that semiconductor companies receive. Western, uh, you know, Korean, Taiwanese, American, European companies are basically all the, the, the small, um, uh, the small uh, uh, little things here, while Chinese companies are all these, uh, these big, um, big ones. Chinese companies receive a lot, and um, even European and American ones receive a lot of state funding in this sector. It's a sector where... There's a lot of public money involved, but basically the idea is here that China is really trying to spend its way into becoming a technological leader in this field. But it's not only semiconductors, it's also something like electric vehicles. Right? Electric vehicles, China has been spending hundreds of billions of, of dollars just in the last 10 or so years to develop this industry, you know, to, uh, um, to, to, yeah, to attract this manufacturing, to develop the whole industry, not only in manufacturing the, whole, the vehicle, but the whole value chain that goes into electric vehicles, from uh, designing the batteries, the stuff that goes into the batteries, the raw materials, and so on. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. But um, just to uh, exemplify the kind of spending that China has been doing in these kind of emerging and modern technological uh, fields.
technology transfer is sort of the second um, item I identified. Um, technology transfer has been happening for a while, and there's also a lot of technology transfer in the global economy that is fair, at least that's how we define it, as fair, that is when, it, when the company agrees it wants to, to give uh, technology transfer, or if a government, for example, agrees for, a le uh, for, for less developed countries to transfer technology, right? Good example is this debate of whether um, the technology that went into the COVID vaccines should be transferred, the know-how, the intellectual property should be transferred to developing countries so they can develop their own vaccine. Governments have been doing this also throughout the past. So there's a, there's a lot of legal technology transfer, but China has been very active in, in, in forcing technology transfer um, from companies in different ways. One way is the inward way. So in the last 20 years, a lot of companies, Western companies, wanted to go to China, access the Chinese market, of course, uh, over uh, hundreds of millions of consumers. If that company wanted to access the market, China basically said you can only access the market if you um, join uh, what's called a joint venture, a JV. So you can only join if you get together with a Chinese uh, equivalent, a Chinese company. You get together in, a comp in, a, in one new company, 50-50 shares. And within that joint venture, basically, there was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of technology transfer that was happening. So in order to access the Chinese market, in other words, there was a lot of um, demands that only, you can only come if you, if you give us your, uh, um, your know-how, your intellectual property, and, and, and so forth. This was illegal. So the, the, the China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, and it agreed explicitly that this is not something that is allowed to do. Um, whether you know, we agree with the, it should be illegal or not is another question, but China agreed that it, that it would not do these kind of practices. Factually, it did for 20 years. And um, even when there was not an explicit way that uh, a company comes to China and has to explicitly hand over an intellectual property, there was a lot of uh, implicit kind of transfers through all sorts of, of, of licensing. You can only get a license to sell your product here. If you do this, you can only get through the administration of, 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 of uh, administrative hurdles if you do that. So there are a lot of um, ways of, of, of doing this. Um, plus, there were also, of course, sometimes theft. So sometimes when we think of technology transfer, we think of oh, cyber theft. You know, China is stealing some database, and it's stealing the database of some company, and then it gets to these trade secrets. It happened. It happens. But it's really not a huge problem. Uh, it's, we have, of course, a lot of cases where there's outright theft, uh, um, cyber theft most, mostly, but it's much more about companies basically selling um, their own trade secrets. Now, of course, you could say, why are companies doing this? They could just not do that. They could say, well, you know, I'm not going to sell, I'm not going to give away my trade secrets. I'm just not going to access your market. But, um, yeah, it's, it's in a way also a fair point. You know, companies have been... Uh, complicit in this. They underestimated how China could use these, this know-how very quickly. There's, for example, great cases, um, high-speed rail, right? High-speed rail, China today is an absolute leader. It's the most dominant player in high-speed rail. It's a European technology where European was, and Japanese companies were leading for many years. They wanted to access the Chinese market in the late 90s, and um, Siemens and and Alstom and so on, these big European players, were asked to hand over also these, sec uh, these, uh, these secrets in joint ventures. There's great you know, data of, of internal emails where also managers at, at Siemens and Alstom totally underestimated what China would be able to do with this. Sort of not looking further beyond than 10 years, they thought, well, it's not great, but China will not be able to catch up in this technology. It's such a it's such a difficult technology to develop. 15 years later, China completely replaced all uh, European companies in China, uh, has now the biggest high-speed rail companies in the world, and is also now competing internationally, so in other markets, in Europe, but especially in other markets in, 
um, in, 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 in emerging economies. So there's lots of examples like this. Anyway, the other example was, of course, that China in the 2000s, especially in the 2010s, had all of, all of a sudden amassed so much capital from being open for international trade for about 10, 15 years that a lot of its companies went abroad to invest. Like all the companies do, they invest internationally. Um, uh, it's, a, of course, an important aspect of any big company, multinational company. But China's foreign direct investment, FDI, really surged in, in Europe and America in particular. And this was at the beginning very much um, seen as a positive thing also in Europe, right? Um, great opportunities, great cash flow coming in. But it surged quite dramatically. Um, and it was also targeting in 2016, it peaked. And it was clear after some years and some studies that Chinese foreign direct investment was targeting these critical technologies that it identified. It was not only some business decision, a company wanting to access some business uh, in, in Europe, but a lot of it, data showed, was driven by the state. The state set targets. We want to lead in certain technologies we identified, made in China 2025, for example. We want to lead in advanced manufacturing technology. So we are, you know, they supported their companies, state companies, but also private companies, to acquire especially technology abroad that was deemed critical, where China wanted to become self-reliant in the future. And that took a while for, for states to realize, but this is sort of a state-directed uh, strategy that led to a lot of problems um, eventually in Europe, but I'll come to that in a second. The final dimension of China's tech gambit, as I would call it, technology gambit, was technical standardization. I already said standardization is sort of a very important aspect of how technologies become global. If you don't have the, the, the standard, you can't, your technology will never scale. And those who develop the standard are able to, you know, they don't have to adapt. If I'm already developing another piece of, of, of paper that is just a bit smaller, and then it turns out that the DIN A4 standard is the one that's global, I will have to change my process. Right? It will cost me money, I'm less competitive. So standards are absolutely key. But the way standards work, the way the West has done standards is that we have completely left it to the private companies. Right? The state has completely withdrawn from standardization. We had competition over technical standards also uh, at the turn of the uh, 19th century, when Germany and Imperial Germany and Imperial Britain were also politically fighting over standards of, of telecommunication and so on. But over the decades, the states in the West really retreated. We set up standardization bodies, which are technocratic bodies, where companies sort of compete over who has the best standard. The best standard is the one that's the most uh, has the most utility for consumers and, and, and just being the best standard. But when China really developed its interest again in technical standardization, it was not just Chinese companies who were trying to compete with what's the best technical standard, but there was a lot of state interest that China will become a dominant standard power. So the Chinese state really tried to access or in, well, not infiltrate, but really pushed that in international standard bodies, it, it the, the state and the, its companies are represented uh, in, in powerful bodies, in powerful working groups where these kind of decisions are being taken. Um, that's not something totally bad, but it, it sort of went against the grain of how Europe, America, Japan, Western liberal market economies thought about standardization. It should not be the state who... Who, who does it? It should be all about the companies competing over who has the best standard, right? China also deliberately supported national standards and protected them. So those standards that were developed by the Chinese standardization bodies at home, even if they were inferior, right? The Chinese standard said, "My, way, maybe the bottle of 0 0.47 liters would be better." As a a stupid example, but just to, to exemplify it, right? even that it would be better because we have developed it, then China, the Chinese state protected them that these national standards, China national standards, 
would not have to compete with international standards. It com protected them from international uh, competition over standards until these companies, state-owned companies, or also private ones, had a huge scale already. And, um, and would then, all of a sudden, you know, a huge Chinese market, they could build a huge scale, these companies, with their products. And then, all of a sudden, they would burst into the national scene and, and, and promote these standards internationally. For example, through the Belt and Road Initiative, or the digital aspect of the, the, the digital Silk Road, uh, which I think all of you, of course, know. Um, part of it was also standardization. So China had memorandums of understanding with countries and said, um, you know, if we are going to build here, if we are going to invest, and we are going to invest in, um, for example, a digital Silk Road, so we're, we're building a dat data center, right? Uh, we have a data company, ZTE, for example, a national champion, and they're going to build a data center, but they're going to build it with their standards. They, they have some standards that may be not accepted by international standard bodies, but they are national Chinese standards. So you only get this contract if you accept also these standards. So it's a way of in, uh, internationalizing these standards, um, which is uh, causing some concern for the, the Chinese state is very active in this field. Anywho, these are sort of the three um, um, actions or pillars of, of what China is doing. There's a lot of going on more, but it's sort of the high-level pillars of, of China's technology strategy. As I said, this was beginning to cause a lot of um, growing concern, especially in, uh, in, in, in America, but then also increasingly in Europe. And since 2015 or 2016, we have seen major response, right? This kind of open uh, economic system that we had for a long time has been, for the last past five, six, seven years, gradually closed, um, or mostly quite narrow, but the direction of travel is quite clear. So we have seen more investment restrictions, specifically for Chinese investors, as a response to these very active Chinese investors in America and Europe. We have, as I have started out, seen more and more technology restrictions. So when I started out, I said last week was sort of the new high, but we've seen technology restrictions, especially from America, really tightened since especially Trump came to power in America. We've seen more trade protections also in Europe, um, new instruments to, to make sure that we, we protect ourselves better. We see more infrastructure protections, the big debate about 5G, right? Um, to what degree should Chinese companies be active, especially Chinese technology companies, be active in, in Europe and elsewhere? And we have seen a huge revival of industrial policy also in Europe and in America. Quite surprising because we have been, for 20 years, been very much against active industrial policy. The state should not guide the economy, in other words. Right? The economy, the free market, decides where resources are allocated. For 20 years, we have been very upset that China is the Chinese government is identifying all these lists and industries and technologies, and, and then it, the state defines, some bureaucrats define, and they then try to allocate or channel resources. We've been trying to fight this for 20 years, unsuccessfully, and now, for a couple of years, basically we are becoming more Chinese, if you will. Right? There's a lot of industrial policy activity. We are also in Europe, we are identifying these technologies, what is important for our future, where do we have to be independent, sovereign, what have you. And so how do we make sure that money, resources are channeled to what a government or the European Commission or someone else uh, defines. So it's quite a significant shift. Um, but yeah, this is not about America and Europe, but about China. So. Um, What's not only about policy, though, uh, so this is basically a little policy change, right? I'm not going to go into more detail, but what's perhaps more interesting, I think, is also this change in narrative, right? Um, this idea that China had for a long time that he who controls technology is sort of the master of, of the state, of, of international power. This has been completely accepted now also in 
in, in America, certainly, but also in Europe. Right, I just collected some quotes that I found quite significant um, that give away a bit to this technology competition. So this is from the US Pentagon from 2017. This is sort of just when uh, Trump came to power and this technology competition really spoil, uh, or, or, or spilled over. If we allow China access to the same technologies concurrently, then not only may we lose our technological superiority, but we may even be facilitating China's technological superiority. The big threat that China could level on the technological sphere. So something needs to be done about that. Similar from a, um, from a commission within Congress, Chinese F foreign direct investment is targeting industries deemed strategic by the Chinese government, leading to the transfer of valuable US assets, intellectual property, and technology to China, presenting potential risks to critical US economic and national security interests. This might sound to some of you like very obvious, but this is really, it was a sea change because for the last 50 years, the whole idea was that if you're open and others can invest in your economy, this is beneficial. This is beneficial also to, nat to national security. It means that your companies have the best access to finance they are most competitive, and this will allow them to get the biggest um, uh, returns on their business. They will allow them to invest again, and that investment will pay off because it will lead to research and new innovation. So the, the idea was really completely turned on its head that openness, economic openness, is beneficial for national security. And that within the short span of a few years, or maybe even one or two years in America, it really turned on its head. Director of the CIA, William Burns, technology is the main arena for competition and rivalry, rivalry with China. Hillary Clinton, right, um, two years ago. So it's not only enough to prioritize materials and technologies used for weapons, but National security is also all about controlling pharmaceuticals, clean energy, 5G networks, and artificial intelligence, right? So this, this idea of what is national security, what, is econ what are economic assets that are vital for national security has absolutely ballooned, right? It used to be quite narrow, it used to be quite obvious. Of course, we're not going to sell some missile technology to China. That was always obvious, right? They will always control that or some, you know, something that's usable for war, gaming, or for nuclear proliferation, of course, these kind of things. But within a couple of years, it expanded completely. Now it's open, everything is potentially national security, pharmaceuticals, right? Clean energy, that's quite significant. And this is not just some statement. In fact, the Biden administration has, just a few months ago, uh, published a, an executive order where exactly this is said. Clean energy, so wind, solar, and so on, is a potential threat. Whoever controls clean energy technology is a potential threat to national security in America. It opens everything to national security, and therefore everything to competition. And that's why it's quite dangerous and quite a new age that we are in. But it's also in Europe, right? We are not America, but these ideas, these geoeconomic ideas that we're in this fundamental competition over who controls the future, who controls the technology that lies at the future, is growing very much in Europe also. Right? These are some statements from French uh, politicians, which is uh, perhaps not uh, too surprising. We've always held these ideas more closely than others, perhaps. But it's not only a French idea anymore. It has become very much a European idea. Thierry Breton, the French commissioner, uh, you know, identified that we are in a technological war being waged between the United States and China. Europe must now lay the foundations of its sovereignty. Um, it's time to have a discussion without naivety and without taboos on the toolbox we need to guarantee our security of supply for our most critical value chains in case of crisis. Most critical value chains used to be uh, weapons value chains, arms, and so on. Now it's potentially everything. And President von der Leyen also spoke of semiconductors, which are the center of strong geostrategic interests and at the core of the global technological race. 
superpowers are keen to secure the supply, and so on and so forth. Europe cannot and will not lag behind. Right? This is a question of, of, uh, of, of, of great power uh, importance. It's not just a matter of our competitiveness, this is also a matter of tech sovereignty. So you see, it's not only that we need companies to make money, and it's good to have big companies in this space because they make a lot of money, and it's important for jobs, and it's important for taxpayers, and so on. It's about something much more. It's about really our existence, our sovereignty. And so I said in China, this has been definitely this idea, this idea of... Uh, of being self-reliant, sovereign, or whatever you want to call it, it's all the same kind of string of ideas, um, has been around for much longer, I said, but it really also um, accelerated um, as a response to what America and Europe uh, have said and so on. So Xi Jinping in 2018 said, our dependence on core technology is the biggest hidden trouble for us. Um, heavy dependence on imported core technology is like building a house on top of someone else's walls. No matter how big and how beautiful it is, it won't remain standing during a storm. In 2021, he already said, technological innovation has become the main battleground for the global playing field, and competition for tech dominance will grow uh, unprecedentedly fierce. And he was right. It has grown more fierce since. So in a way, they're all kind of the same ideas, my point here, right? Uh, these, these phrases you wouldn't be able to tell if I wouldn't put the picture here of Xi Jinping, whether this is from von der Leyen or from Xi Jinping personally, right? In order to safeguard China's industrial security and national security, we must focus on building production chains and supply chains that are independently controllable, self-reliant in other words, right? Autonomous, controllable, reliable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We cannot be dependent. So that's the kind of narrative that's very strong, and that's what I call geoeconomic narrative. And irrespective of the policies that we implement, um, you know, whether we screen foreign investments or we use some other trade instruments, this idea that we are competing and that we are dependent and that we're vulnerable are really powerful in driving policies also in all these three powers, in Europe, in America, and China. Arguably more powerful in America and China than in Europe, but we are lagging a couple of years behind, but we are also sort of on this track. Right. Um, so finally, I brought some graphs um, because the question is, of course, is China a technological power already, and has it been successful or not? Um, which is a huge question, and obviously I can't answer it. I just brought some graphs to sort of um, to show a bit how China has been catching up, and where it might be already leading, and where it might not be leading. So that's research and development spending. That's the bread and butter of all innovation, right? You need to spend on research. You need to build your universities. You need to fund them well. And China is the red line here that's absolutely catapulting to the top, right? It's an sort of unstoppable way of becoming the biggest research and development spending power, spending power perhaps in the world. Now, it's a bit outdated. This is from 2018. And of course, you could say, well, if you adjust it for how many people there are for per capita spending, then China ranks very much, much, much lower than, um, than, than most developed countries. Still, I think this exemplifies where China is going. It is amassing um, more public spending for universities, for research grants, and so on, especially in these sectors that it identifies as critical, STEM research and technology research. <clears throat> Patents, right? Also bread and butter of innovation. Um, China has been churning out a lot of patents in a lot of technologies. Um, there's, so, there's Now and then you see graphs and, and newspaper articles perhaps where China is uh, leading in a lot of patents. It, it's producing a lot of patents, but there's also a bit of a difference between patents. So not, all, not all patents are very good. A lot of trash. 
you need to have your patterns basically uh, not only accepted if you are a Chinese company and develop something, you get a Chinese patent in China, it's okay, but ideally you want to also have that patent be accepted in Europe, in Japan, and America. That makes it a very high quality patent. China's not so good in that. So here's, yeah, you, sorry, you can't really see anything here, but uh, basically Europe is, is, is blue and these are 10 future-oriented technologies, like automation, uh, connectivity, next generation computing, artificial intelligence, and so on. Um, China is red, so it has been catching up a lot also in these quality patterns, it's about quality patterns, um, but it's definitely not leading um, like sometimes you might see in, in, in data. Um, so we have to make sure that pa patterns are also well accepted globally. Supercomputers, right? Uh, very important sort of emerging technology, or well, not really emerging, it's been around forever, but there's quite some breakthrough in supercomputing, the kind of power that supercomputers can do, the kind of computations that are expected, and the kind of research breakthroughs supercomputers are expected to make, especially in biosciences. So, uh, um, so we see a lot of uh, progress in, in the development of supercomputers, the kind of uh, computations they can do every second. China has been also uh, very powerful in this field for the last couple of years. It's been catching up a lot. So it's the share of the 500 fastest supercomputers in the world. As you can see, China is the second largest uh, power already in terms of supercomputers, perhaps even the largest. Artificial intelligence, huge field, obviously. Um, it's Again, difficult to, to dissect what, what really where China stands. On the left, we have global output of scientific papers. So China, like with patents, is churning out a lot of scientific papers. It's in a lot of publications. It's leading a lot of the journals in, in, in the sciences and uh, computer sciences and so on. So already China is producing the most scientific papers in this field. Um, however, it's this is sort of showing the conferences, conference citations. Um, in other words, you know, you can write a lot of papers, but if no one else reads them or cites them, they're not as powerful, perhaps. But also here, China is behind America and Europe, but it's also catching up a lot. So it's becoming really a, a scientific leader in artificial intelligence, right? And this is private investment in artificial intelligence, the last graph on the right. So uh, America is leading all the way. Companies in America, in other words, are investing heavily in artificial intelligence, in research, but also in the commercialization of that research. And you can see that the rest is really far off. The European Union is uh, far behind on making sh or enabling our companies to, to take risks and invest in this significant uh, technology for the future. Quantum, this is again only number of patents. I already said that we shouldn't maybe look at only the patents, um, but it's about the quality of patents. But I couldn't find anything on that. But basically, you can see here what I said earlier. China is leading by far in terms of trying to hammer out patents. It's developing a lot of ideas and so on. How many of them actually any good is hard. to. I didn't find anything on that. But it just gives the, the magnitude of, of what China is doing in these very much future technologies, right? It has four times as many uh, um, patent applications or, or granted patents than America, and the rest is completely far off. Biosciences, also something for the future. This is uh, publications on CRISPR, uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, medical techniques that is uh, with a lot of focus on, that it might bring a lot of uh, added benefit to, to, to research and, and, and treatment of um, to the pharmaceutical industry and how they can treat diseases. China is also extremely active in this future, um, future medical tech field. But China is especially strong in green energy technologies, right? So this is kind of a neat graph because it shows China's... Uh, um, uh, market dominance in many of the different green energy technologies. Uh, sales of electric vehicles, 
So red is obviously China. Wind turbine manufacturing, um, polysilicon, that's the, the chemical or the, the raw material that goes into uh, solar panels. But especially a lot of the raw materials and uh, rare earths and cobalt and so on that are at the heart of many of these green technologies. Um, I'll come back to that in one second. But green energy is obviously very much our focus at the moment also. We need to invest heavily in green energy. We need to get rid of one dependence on Russia and fossil fuels. And we need to shift into green energy. But the danger is, of course, that China is already very much dominating across many of these um, technologies and many of these supply chains. So do we want to exchange one dependency for another? And how do we make sure that we don't? The electric vehicle battery value chain is one of the green energy technologies, right? So China not only produces already more than half of all electric vehicles uh, uh, today, but especially the stuff that goes into them, batteries. Almost 80% of batteries are produced by China. And especially all the minerals, the materials and uh, that go into them. And out of these materials, you make cells and you make anodes and, and diodes, and they go into battery cells and so on. China dominates across the board. So it has been very successful in this technology to become already the dominant player. Solar photovoltaic, same game, right? The, um, uh, here you see 2010, 2015, 2021. Um, product, so pr production of modules, cells, wafers, and polysilicon. These are the things that make a solar photovoltaic cell. So all the input technologies that, that go in and how China has in a span of yeah, a couple of years years or already actually since 2010 really dominated this space it's controlling sometimes more than 80 percent of these technologies that we need for solar panels wind energy i already said quickly earlier but in 2020 2020 china produces 60 percent of all wind turbines and it's not only producing them but also it builds most of them so China is the biggest market. It builds 40% 40, 40 of, of onshore wind turbines, and it, it built 80% of offshore wind, uh, wind turbines in 2020. So it's huge. China is a very dominant player in this field. There's a lot of important European companies who are active in this field, who are the leading technology, group, technology providers for wind, wind energy, Danish companies, German companies, Spanish companies. Right. You see how lopsided this industry is already becoming. China is the most important manufacturer, so these companies buy most of the stuff from China. And the Chinese market is so, so important that it gives a lot of power also to China to, to direct where this industry is going. Right? If you build you know, almost 50% yeah, or 60% of all wind turbines in the world, you have huge power to bend this market also in the future. And raw materials, perhaps most importantly. So raw materials go into everything. Raw materials like rare earths is just one of the raw materials, but it's one of the most important ones because rare earths, you build permanent magnets out of it. Permanent magnets go into everything from electric vehicle motors to wind turbines to fighter jets. You need it for a lot of things. Um, China manufactures 93% of all permanent magnets. That's quite insane, I must say. It's quite insane. But it's also the whole uh, the value chain. So from mining the rare earths, China has 60%. 60 and especially once you get these minerals out of, the, out of the ground, you have to refine them. Then you have to separate them. So there's a whole process step. And most of that stuff is happening in China. Right? So the more you go downstream in this value chain, the more China is an active player in this. This is only one of one raw material, rare earths, or there's actually a couple of them, but this looks very similar for many other um, raw materials. So how did China manage to do that? Right? Why 
is 93% of permanent magnets developed in China? And the answer is basically that China has been really focusing on this for four decades. Right? China has an industrial policy for this particular supply chain since the late 1970s. They spent a lot of money attracting first in the 1980s European-American mining companies who set up shop in China. And first, very basic, they focus only on mining. And over the years, China basically changed its policy to attract and have technology transfer further down into separation and refining of these, met these metals and then building these input um, materials like magnets. So it's been, it's been a long time coming. Um, basically, the West has outsourced this to China over many decades. It's has, it was in the past and still today is environmentally very troublesome. Um, China has attracted this. It has, it has taken the environmental hit for many decades um, because Chinese leaders wanted that. Um, they wanted to attract this, this industry. But now, 40 years later, we stand again in front of this value chain and look at it and see that perhaps we have you know, let this go out a bit too far. Right? Um, maybe this dependence is, is um, quite significant. Finally, semiconductors, that's sort of the big, big one that I started out with, and that's definitely very complex. It's hard to sort of come away with in, in, in one minute with, with conclusions. But China has been trying to, um, as I said, become more self-reliant in developing semiconductors. And the reason why the Americans have tightened the screws on, on China on, in this technology is because China has not been super successful. It's the most complex technology that probably exists. Advanced semiconductors can only be produced, the super advanced stuff. So we measure that by mostly by nanometers, right? So the super advanced stuff, which go from seven nanometers to today that they're, they're developing two or three nanometer chips, um, those can only be produced by two companies, TSMC in Taiwan and Samsung in Korea. It's extremely complex, um, and you can't just you can't just take that industry if you want to. Um, and China has been trying for a lot. It has spent a lot of money on this. Uh, a couple of last years alone, it has spent over 150 billion dollars. It's estimated on this. But its success has been yeah. So it has built some some um, capacities. The, the red and pink ones here are Chinese in the older generation. So bigger chips kind of chips you need for everything from, um, from washing machines to cars to um, toasters to fridges. You also need chips these days, right, because they run on, 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 on some electric uh, circuit. So these are quite old generations. They've already been developed in the, in the early 2000s, and China is more competitive here. It has managed to build a large uh, share in, in, in producing them. But the advanced stuff... So really, these the super high-end chips that you need, for example, for iPhones, they or most the, the modern Samsung or the flagship uh, I, uh, smartphones, they run on really high-end chips, or you know, a MacBook or fighter jets, um, missile defense systems. They need really the high cutting-edge stuff. So it's not been super successful so far for China, and that's why um, America holds a lot of power still in this in this. Uh, in the supply chain, even though America doesn't produce any of the chips, they're all produced by just two companies. American companies hold a lot of the intellectual property, the patents, and that kind of stuff. So it allows them to exert a lot of pressure. And they have a lot of um, suppliers. So even though the stuff is built in Taiwan, Taiwan can't build it without getting stuff from America, Europe, Japan. So it's complex interdependence. And um, the West, or America in particular, holds a lot of power still in this industry. So we don't know um, whether China will be able to become more self-reliant in this field. Now with these sanctions, it's a big question mark, to be honest. Um, these sanctions are really targeting the kind of chips in this segment, so that basically China does not get into this last segment, into these high advanced chips. That's the idea of these um, technology controls of America. 
Um, whether they will be successful, we don't know. Whether it's a good policy is another question. Whether we should um, try to contain China's technological rise is, of course, a big, big question mark. But that's the goal. And uh, we don't know where we'll end up. Right, final slide, I think, was uh, 5G um, and telecommunication equipment. So Huawei and ZTE, the other technology champion in, in China, the state-owned company, have, they have global operations these days, right? So we all know that 5G was quite controversial. But 5G is the very dark red here, but there's also the older generations, 4G and 3G, and other services in the, in the soft patterns that they're offering. Um, and so it just exemplifies that these companies are absolutely everywhere already. They, have, um, they, have, they offer their services and their equipment in the whole world. So this is a field where China has been very successful. Huawei is also a very innovative company um, that has been developing quite a bit. Am I running out of time already? No, good. Right. Is China an attack power? Very big question. Can't really answer that, to be, to be fair. I just thought there's definitely some fields where China is leading. 5G is certainly one of them until the Trump administration put a lot of heavy sanctions and controls on Huawei. It really tried to kill Huawei, basically. It didn't quite succeed, but it succeeded partially. Uh, Huawei's can't get any um, access to advanced chips. So what I said, like the chips you need in your iPhone. Huawei also builds flagship smartphones, but not anymore because you can't, you can't get the chips to run them. So that business model of Huawei is basically pretty much dead. But Huawei is still very much in the 5G space, um, uh, one of the leading companies. Green energy we saw. China is very much leading in many of these um, industries and technologies I, I, I said. Yeah, a challenger, there's probably many more. Uh, we saw artificial intelligence, quantum, and so on. It's not quite clear who is leading. Um, China has, however, definitely also a laggard in many uh, technologies fields. Semiconductors is the most important one because that's where all the action is happening. But also, for example, chemicals, uh, advanced chemicals, that is, and advanced pharmaceuticals. Um, Europe, for example, is very strong and holds a lot of the know-how and intellectual property, and it's very difficult also to leapfrog in these kind of industries. There's many more, of course. I just thought, you know, uh, give a bit of a visual that um, it's complicated. Um, but China is, of course, already a, a, a technology power, but um, it also has a lot of weaknesses still. So it faces a lot of technology innovation challenges. Um, it's, uh, there's a huge debate, of course, if all the, the, these, these policies that China has been doing, pushing a lot of public money into research and so on, is actually a very good policy. Um, China is facing a lot of challenges uh, in, in, yes, in, in technologies that are highly complex. Uh, where there's a lot of demand for international cooperation. So a lot of these technologies are developed not by one country or one company. There's very complex uh, innovation ecosystems that span, of course, the whole world, where China is not as active and has, been, for example, had challenges. But yeah, I mean, for me, the more important one is almost, I mean, it's important what, China is, what kind of policies are effective and which are not effective and where exactly China is leading. But... Um, the politics of it are almost as important, I find. You know, that the sense that, as I showed you, this, showed you this quote earlier of Xi Jinping, the sense that China is more vulnerable, that it needs to control all these technologies, the same ideas that we also increasingly have, that's really powerful. And that's really driving a lot of these policies. You know, whether they're effective or not is then almost like another question. And sanctions and these export controls will almost certainly reinforce them, right? So not everyone in Beijing or China believes in self-reliance. There's obviously, like in Europe or in America, a plethora of ideas and plethora of elites who have very different opinions. China should be more open, China should be more closed, and so on. Those who believe that China needs to become more nationalistic, also become more self-reliant, cut some of its dependencies, 
is definitely being strengthened by sanctions. And that's very important because, um, yeah, if we sanction, we strengthen also these counter forces in other countries. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it's important to keep, to not only look at the technicalities of it, but also what it does politically um, uh, in, in, in China or in Russia, for that matter. Right. Um, so finally, what, what will all of this mean perhaps for the future? That's, I guess, the, the, big, the big question. Um, I would say important is that the coupling is happening. Right? That's, it's really happening. It's limited, and it's limited to certain supply chains at the moment. Uh, semiconductors now, since last week, there's no doubt that this supply chain will never be as global anymore. China will gradually lose access to Western technology in this industry. And that means we are factually decoupling to some degree. Now, that's only one industry, and it's limited. And you could say that's fair, but it's definitely increasing. Right? As I said, there's ideas that perhaps in the clean energy space we might have to decouple because it's a security threat that China is producing all of these. But it's not only the West against China, but also China against the West, because China is also decoupling. Uh, it has, as I said it in the beginning, strategies of dual circulation, which is at heart a strategy of replacing foreign producers in strategic industries. Again, identifying what do we need the most, where do we want to have our champions? And it's, in, in essence, it's also a decoupling strategy. It's, it has a long horizon. In 10 years, we want to produce 50% naturally and so on. But it's, all, it's, it's at heart, it wants to replace also our technologies. So there's a wear and tear. There's a back and forth on both sides. And that's a big question mark what that means for the future. I can't really tell you. But Europe is certainly in it. And we're not driving this, I think. We're certainly captured by what is happening in Washington and Beijing. Um, I think, yeah, we are sort of lagging behind in the narratives also and in the policies, but we are in the middle of it. We cannot just get out of it. And we kind of have to decide where to go from here, right? Do, as I said in the beginning, do we want to go all the way <coughs> with America, for example, on decoupling our technological certain technological technologies, certain industries from China? Can we even? That's also a big question. America has a lot of power, and it's just true. Um, you know, if American sanctions are often extraterritorial, meaning they uh, apply for everyone um, that uses any sort of American know-how, which, for example, in a semiconductor space is everyone. Even though we have powerful companies in this space, because they use some intellectual property or use some uh, patents that are American, they are also part of the sanction regime. And America is dead serious. They will go forward with this. Um, yes, it's a big question. I, I don't know what, 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 what will happen. But the same is, of course, with China. Well, how, how far do we want to stay uh, interdependent or integrated with China in these advanced technologies? We know that China is also using many of these civil technologies or civilian technologies in its military. We under, you know, you, if you were here in the Taiwan uh, debate last week, probably, and there are, of course, military uh, risks also of our technology. So how do we make sure that we are not fueling a military state in China while also retaining the civilian technology integration? It's really, really difficult because many of these technologies are, of course, absolutely dual use. So these artificial intelligence, right? Uh, these chips that America is sanctioning now, they are chips that you need for super advanced artificial intelligence software. The kind of software that you put then into uh, a supercomputer that can then produce super calculations. For example, for pharmaceutical companies that need to find new um, properties to develop drugs uh, to resistant to anything. They need really advanced this is the future of bioscience. They need advanced chips. They, re they need really advanced artificial intelligence programs and supercomputers. At the same time, you need these chips, the same chips, basically, to have the most powerful uh, anti-missile uh, defense system, 
right, to run your fighter jets. You need the same kind of chips. So it's extremely difficult to disentangle these days to say, oh, this chip or this technology is for the military, so we shouldn't sell it, we keep it, and this is just for you know, some commercial activity. It's almost impossible, and that's the difficulty. And that makes it so difficult to say, oh, what do we do? Well, how, do we, how do we stay engaged with, um, with, with China or anyone else, really? How do we make sure that uh, commercial economic activity remains active while we don't uh, support a surveillance state, for example, or support military activity somewhere. These are the big challenges. Um, right, so we need to have something in Europe on this, and uh, so far we are, yeah, this is, we're kind of going with the flow, I think, uh, certainly driven by America, but um, I think at some point in the next years there will be a crunch time to say where do we stand, you know. What do we do? Do we friend shore with America? Do we retain our middle seat in between America and China? Are we even able? Yeah, these are some of the big questions. Um, and at that, I leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tobias, for shedding some light on this geoeconomic uh, narrative. Uh, very interesting indeed, I would say. Valuable insights for us to keep in mind. Uh, you got my attention. I will keep an eye out. Um, before we uh, proceed to the, the side corner of the bar, where we will still host a little networking moment with some refreshments, uh, putting you or giving you the opportunity to still talk a little bit uh, with each other, with our speaker, uh, with Tobias, uh, I would say maybe we can um, have two or, or three questions here in the group that uh, that you would tackle, if that's okay for you, Tobias. Of course. Does anybody have some specific questions? Yeah, so um, very interesting lecture. First, I want to say that. Um, you've talked about China wanting to leave their dependence with the European Union, with the United States, and dependence, dependence kind of being a weakness, but can it also be seen as a strength? Yes, um, <coughs> definitely. So China sees it, yeah, it depends what kind of dependence, right? The China has what we would call asymmetric dependencies that we have on China, rather, so where China has a lot of leverage over us because we need a lot from China. For example, in raw materials, I mentioned this, so China has a lot of power. China has shown in the past, many years ago, it was 12 years ago already, but it showed in the past that it's also willing to weaponize these dependencies. In 2010, it, it, it um, shut exports of these rare earths that I showed you to Japan over a political incident in the South China or in the, in the East China uh, see a fishing boat incident that became a bit of politics. Since then, it hasn't really done so, but it has, for example, also made sure that it has the laws in place that um, it could control the export of raw materials. So when the Trump administration was getting uh, its campaign against Huawei going, the Chinese state also introduced new laws, export control laws, and so, okay, where do we have the leverage? Right? Do they have the leverage on semiconductors? Where do we have the leverage? They have now new laws since 2020 that they could basically overnight also say, for national security reasons, we stop the export of raw materials. They haven't done so, but it's a clear sign, of course, that they are you know, also thinking in these terms. You have, where, are we, where do we have weaknesses? Where do you have strengths? Um, that's one important one. Uh, um, uh, raw materials. Um, there are surely other ones. The idea is right now a bit to find out, right? So many member states and the EU Commission, but also in America and Japan and Korea, everyone is kind of, the administrations are trying to look into these dependencies, they look into their supply chains. Well, hang on, it turned out during COVID that we're dependent on paracetamol from one company in India, you know, and when that company in India can't produce paracetamol. We don't have 70% of paracetamol comes from this one company. What? That's dangerous. We should know about this. Um, and, but, no, but governments didn't really know about this because they let the free economy sort of do what it does. So right now we're looking a lot into this. There's this mapping of supply chains, um, a lot of data ag uh, aggregation, um, and China is doing the same. 
Um, and then you kind of have to see, you know, where, where are we dangerously dependent on, on China or Russia or also America for that matter, you know, or Taiwan, it doesn't really matter if it's even a friend or foe. We should not be, we should not get 90% of chips from one company, right? Uh, we should not get 90% of raw materials from one country and we should not get uh, yeah, 90 or 80% of pharmaceuticals from one region. Uh, it's just too dangerous and that's sort of the, the play. Um, yeah, China has some uh, something I didn't look at here because I talked about technology, but China's real Achilles heel is not only semiconductors, but also finance. American sanctions are so powerful because the dollar is the most powerful currency in the world. And it means that a lot of the trade and a lot of the international economy is done in a dollar. And if you trade in dollars, so if I'm buying this bottle of water in Brazil, I'll probably pay in dollar because that's just how the global economy works. But if I pay in dollar, that means my transaction will be necessarily go through an American office somewhere that sits somewhere in New York. Just they just do, you know, the computer just says X, Y, trade is done. But if they wanted to, they could of course block this. And that's extremely powerful. It's the most powerful geoeconomic weapon there is for the Americans. China has been trying for a long time to get rid of this financial dependence, and it's now showing us how powerful that is with the sanctions on, on Russia. Much of that is either technology or the financial sanctions. But it's proving very, very difficult for China, and it doesn't look very promising either. Mostly it's China's own fault because it does not want... So in order to, for you to have a global currency, you must allow everyone to use that currency. If I want to... Uh, again, buy this bottle of water in Brazil, and I want to use the renminbi, I can't. The Chinese bank doesn't allow me, because they are afraid that if I'm using um, that money and just do whatever I want to, it becomes a huge risk for them. You have, you know, I have, they have financial risk. They don't know what's happening with their money. So they don't allow this. They don't allow the, their currency to trade internationally. And that means their currency is very, very weak internationally. Only 2% of international economic transactions are done in the renminbi. 2%, it's nothing. And that's been like this for 10 years, despite the Chinese government always writing, we need to get rid of this dependence and we want to make uh, our currency, international currency, it's not going so well. So that's a big, big, big weakness for China and a big, big, big power for America. And, uh, and yeah, and Europe is... Um, is uh, is sort of flying under this under American wings also with the sanctions on, on on Russia at the moment. Most of these sanctions are so powerful because of America, and um, yeah, it's also right now it's beneficial for us. But uh, of course, the question is, how does this look in the future? Thank you, Tobias. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, my question relates more to Europe's reaction to China's policies, uh, more specifically on uh, technology standards. So now the EU has this cooperation mechanism, trade and technology council with the US. But at the same time, we see that with the invasion of Ukraine, it's more or less consumed by this event. And I was wondering, is this to the advantage of China? And secondly, do you see in the near future, an alternative where the EU creates more of this kind of geo-economic alliances with other countries, uh, such as the Trade and Technology Council. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So the second question, definitely, it's happening already, I think. So there's a lot, lot more partnerships developing, economic security partnerships between um, between all sorts of players, but also the European Union is more active. Uh, for example, there's more, uh, there's new partnerships on raw materials. So knowing that we're dependent so much on raw materials and we don't really ha we have some in Europe, but we also need our partners. Why don't they produce so much? You know, what's happening? Why, why, do, we, why do we get 90% of them from China? Um, so the governments are trying more actively to help this industry or the supply chain along. So there's new agreements, for example, with research-rich countries, Canada, Australia, but also Namibia, for example, now. There's um, talks with other countries in the Western Balkans where there's, uh, where there's a lot of resources 
and they try to also f have political and economic focus to say what what do we need to have a partnership with these countries so that our that industry comes there invests and uh, that we have a more diversified supply so there's a lot of focus on this politically whether it will succeed uh, yet to be seen but there's more for example the global gateway this big investment uh, idea it's unfortunately not moving anywhere but the idea is very much similar you know to have we have a lot of international economic activity our companies invest globally also in infrastructure it's not just the chinese but now we have a lot of funding on development aid for example so how can we make sure that it's a bit more focused that we make sure these resources are more targeting um partners that we have resources that we need industries that we want to boost so there's a lot of thinking uh, happening at the eu level um and Trade and Technology Council, your first question is is yeah is very ambitious. I think it has um, several working groups. It's not traditional trade policy, but it's really future uh, future oriented working group. So, for example, you said this: they want to uh, make sure that we are developing new technologies, clean energy technologies, green energy technologies on electric vehicles, for example. European industry is developing a lot. So they're developing new battery, a new battery technology that makes it more efficient, for example. So how do we make sure the American company might be doing the same thing? How do we make sure that before they now build this and develop their own standard, and then in 10 years we're competing with these standards, the, the European companies have their one standard and the Americans have another standard, it would be a big trade um, issue. We can't then just ship European uh, technology to America or vice versa. So the idea is pretty good to say, let's go get together early, to have this discussion early on, bring the industry together and say, look, uh, we both want to develop this industry. How can we uh, make sure that we develop the same standards? So very broadly speaking, right? The, the, the idea is definitely very good. Unfortunately, it's not going so well. Um, there's no really... Yeah, there's a lot of there's not really political buy-in at the moment in this U.S. EU Trade Council. Um, there's no great outcome so far. It's been going on for two years, I think, and unfortunately, yeah, the ambition was very good, but it's no no good outcome yet. Um, so, yeah, we have to treat this a bit with caution because it's easy to write something down on paper, um, but to make something happen is is, is quite difficult. Okay, and then maybe one more, one last question. It's, uh, yeah. <coughs> can take them both. True. Um, my question, I would focus a little bit more on the political aspect. So with the party congress, just like happened a few, um, a few days ago, I wanted to ask you, we talked a lot about how like um, interdependence between China and the US and China and the EU could like damage both parties as well. But my question now would be like a little bit more what you think, like how can China damage itself? Because with the zero COVID policy and everything, um, the economy of the like state right now is like a little bit decreasing. And yeah, how would you like see the future? Because the um, people right now surrounding um, Xi, they are they stand for a little bit more like protectionism. And yeah, how would you like um, see the future of that for China? Yeah, um, good question. I yeah, so I'm not a Chinese economy expert at all, but it's true that there's a lot of um, negative signs for the Chinese economy in general. These kind of growth potential, even 5 to 6% that the Chinese um, uh, government has been portraying also for the next years is very much in question. They had huge damage uh, from their COVID policy. There was a very good report from the European Chamber of Commerce in China that write an annual report laying out the kind of impact that it had on European businesses, how many businesses are, are thinking of retreating from China, getting out of China, mostly because of this COVID policy, which was so uh, disruptive because yeah, there was no ability to speak in person and so on. So 
to be honest, it's looking quite dramatic um, for the Chinese economy. Um, at the same time, yeah, so there's always a lot of, um, it has been now for two, three years, a lot of uh, voices of, of companies also who have been quite uh, outspoken that they also want to diversify, get out of China. There's now and then you read newspaper articles of, of um, companies getting out of China, investing in India and so on. On the whole, it's not quite clear yet, I think, of whether this is, you know, if we can, if it really makes a huge impact, um, these individual cases, um, and whether or not if COVID policy might change, that this might turn around. So there's kind of geopolitical argument that companies get out of China because of potential trade war with America or something like this is not quite clear. I think it's mostly Chinese COVID policy that has an impact. At least that's also what this shows, the, the data shows from the Chamber of Commerce in China. So it's a very volatile situation. It's difficult to say, you know, this is the trajectory of, of, of companies there. I think they are, um, in the last two years, have really been yeah, trying to, to diversify away. At the same time, yeah, it might change quite quickly. We see the German government is uh, you know, traveling to China now with a big delegation of businesses. There have been some big announcement of investments in China, especially by German companies. So big companies in particular are doubling down also on China. Um, but smaller companies on the whole seem to be getting out. There was a very influential um, Rhodium report. A Rhodium Group is a research analyst, you might have seen it. Uh, basically showing that uh, who invests in China, it's becoming only a few big companies are really the main drivers of, of economic investment in China. Most of them are German or French, but almost all, uh, three out of the five biggest ones are Germans. So Volkswagen, BMW, and BASF, the biggest chemical producers, these are the drivers of investment in China. They're betting big on China. And they are the drivers of, of most of this activity, where smaller and medium-sized enterprises are more and more driven out of the Chinese market, perhaps. They have, have more and more hurdles. They cannot afford to, to have two operations, one that is China-specific, one that is Europe-specific. For them, this is too much of a cost. So they are struggling much more. So that makes it very difficult for politics also, because um, you have a debate that is very much shaped, at least in the German case, um, by big companies, who, who have big bets on China and who, um, um, who have a lot of impact on the, on the politics of it. Um, but they are only really a small part of the picture, perhaps. They are driving the, the economic activity in China, but they don't really... Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the economic relations with China are so much more complex and so many more small and medium-sized enterprises face so much struggle that perhaps their voices are not really heard in this political debate. Um, so yeah, it's very volatile. I, I, I wouldn't want to say, you know, where, where it's going because, yeah, for one year we've been saying this COVID policy in China is around the corner and it will be soon, it will be gone. And then things will go back to normal. There's also always voices, um, you know, who've now before the party Congress have been saying, oh, and if this leader and that leader, this leader has a more market-oriented background, so this might be a sign that China is committing to more market reforms. But I don't know. I'm not an expert on Chinese internal politics. But, yeah, the, what it would take for China to really um, go back to a more market, liberal market reform path, like it has been on before 2013, seems very distant. It really rather seems like that Xi Jinping has it locked under power and that there's, it will be more difficult. And the policies that China is you know, hammering out and dual circulation and so on, they really also show where things are going in a way and what China is really targeting. And that is the replacement of many of these industries that still thrive today. Chemical industry, for example, yeah, BSF, huge investment in China. They are still very much leading in this technology field. They have the intellectual property, but yeah, the question is how long will this continue? And um, should governments also allow for this kind of risk to happen? Should they allow companies to, to make these huge bets on, on a China that is perhaps actually trying to replace you in this industry quite offensively? Yeah, big questions. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, just from the perspective from international relations, if you look a bit theoretical, it's quite clear that uh, America acts like a new new realistic or classic realistic state, and China, as well as a new or classic realistic state. Uh, but on the other hand, Europe acts from liberalism uh, in international perspective, and I'm a bit curious. Do you think that we have been a bit naive to act as a liberal state when other big powers act as neoclassical realists or classic realists? Uh, would you think we can still compete from a liberalism perspective against uh, neoclassical or realistic uh, states? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say that um, America has, until very recently, been very liberal in its economic policy, much more liberal than Europe. And basically this idea that economic integration with China is a benefit, also I said this earlier, right, is a benefit for and uh, not only for the whole world and for all, all uh, for for the development of, of of other countries, but it's a net benefit for America. That's a security benefit for America, and that's a liberal idea that economic integration is beneficial for everyone. Um, and until very recently, and there's still many in Washington who believe this very much die hard. This is the idea. Um, so it changed only very recently. And it's also, yeah, now it seems like there's no more way back because those who are more realist are, uh, are really on the, on the leading edge in, in Washington. Um, in Europe, we're not that liberal anymore, I think, uh, maybe in sort of traditional foreign policy, but economic policy, I didn't go into detail here. I just sort of sketched that we are responding, but it's really shifting dramatically almost. Um, the kind of industrial policy that now is developed in Europe, it's... It's not liberal at policy anymore. It's identifying, uh, yeah, it's already identifying that the state has to have a power to play in the market. The state needs to define what's important. The state needs to sort of manage and direct a bit, not full scale like a Soviet kind of uh, uh, economy, but still, it's a very much a dramatic kind of shift from where we were only six years ago. It's really dramatic. It really has nothing to do anymore with the kind of liberal globalization spirit that was around yeah, 2012, 2010, when we were diehard. We, but yeah, Europe basically was diehard liberal. The benefits of globalization were by far seen to outweigh the, the risks. And that's really, really, really fading a lot, where yeah, we have now much more. A lot of these policies are motivated by reference to what does it do with China? Like, where do we, you know, how does China, what does China do in this industry? What does America do in this industry? That's why we need to be active. But under a liberal mindset, that is not allowed almost. You, the state should not make these kind of assessments about the economy. It's the market which decides. Um, so have we been naive? The last, the last part is, I would say, it's very fashionable to say this now. We've been so naive that... Everyone was doing geopolitics but us. But that's not really true, I think. I think we were not really naive. This assessment in 2010 or 2012 to bet on China, bet on economic integration with China, I think was right. It looked like it might work. And the geopolitical uh, framing that this would lead to you know, deep interdependence, it would lead to create a middle class in China, that middle class would push for uh, more freedoms, ideally for more political freedoms, but at least for more economic freedoms, and that would stabilize relationships. It's not a dead idea, and I don't think it's particularly naive, and it looked at a time like a fair bet. It was a bet, and it didn't really work, and of course we have to draw lessons from it. Why didn't it work? Why did it work with some countries? For example, in the European neighborhood, a lot of our economic integration with our neighborhood was quite successful. The assimilation of post-Soviet states into the European Union, largely pre premised also on a liberal economic integration. It worked, I think, but not with Russia and certainly not with China. So there's definitely lessons to be drawn. But I wouldn't have wanted to change it. I think it was the right policy back then. And uh, we shouldn't completely throw it overboard now either, I think. Um, I think there's a, quite some danger of the, um, some of these voices um, that would really want to throw over sort of any sort of integration with 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 a rival, that this is only negative uh, security externality. So, yeah, 
Now, that's, of course, difficult to say because we have made major mistakes, especially with Russia, right? This idea of economic integration, energy integration with Russia, that it would uh, discipline Russia was perhaps the biggest uh, strategic blunder that Europe and especially Germany has done this century, right? And the, the ramifications of this will be, are already dramatic, and they will be even more dramatic in the future, perhaps. So it's pretty hard at the moment to defend this idea that economic integration with Russia was at a time perhaps a decent bet when it failed so much. But um, yeah, I don't have a particular you know, straight answer of how we should do it now with China, but it would also be, I think, a danger to now completely go the other way around and think that we have to completely uh, disintegrate. Uh, we should keep some also liberal economic spirit very much alive. Thank you so much, Tobias. <clears throat> and to uh, yeah, well, look back at what I said last week, uh, it's never a matter of uh, thinking black and white, I think. Uh, we should take all the grades of shade, uh, shade of, shades of gray in between. Um, we do referring to a big part of the market on the high-speed trains already in hands of China at the moment, Tobias, as a kind of thank you uh, very much big thank you for you. Uh, I brought a book um, about the first Belgian engineers who went uh, to China between 1870 and 1930. So I think, uh, yeah, well, it might be interesting uh, to read how they uh, looked on the Chinese uh, culture, how they uh, reflected on it, how they experienced it. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you very much for this wonderful uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Here behind you have the smaller publication of the China platform where we, uh, where we just issued the success stories of our uh, faculties uh, on the occasion of the 15th anniversary. So thank you very much. Excellent. And I would like to end this uh, lecture moment, this second lecture, by inviting you, warmly inviting you, to join us to the ground floor, uh, the cafe, well, in fact, the backside of the cafe, where we can still have some small refreshments and make me still can have some discussions. I thank you all for uh, attending today. <laughs>